Good morning. My name is Janet Grimes. I'm your lay leader today. We're glad you're here. Please, please take time uh, to complete the communications and prayer requests forms found in your bulletin. These forms will be collected during the service and all prayers will be lifted up today and remembered throughout the week. Afterwards, please re join us for refreshments in the worship room, uh, after worship in the East Room. And if you have need of our family worship uh, room, it's right outside this way to the sanctuary. Thank yous are to Bob Zerko and Drew Zerko for greeters, Drew Zerko for our acolyte, and Jim and Donna Drenth for treats and flowers today. If you will please make sure that you review your bulletin for the various announcements that are listed in there for July and August. Um, important reminders, Vacation Bible School is on Friday and Saturday, July 10th and 11th. Friday night, 6.30 to 8, and Saturday, 10 to 5, and it will be followed by a cookout. Our quarterly meeting is coming up on July 12th, and that's about, you can see the rest of this stuff. Are there any other announcements? Yes, sir. Are there any other announcements? All righty. Happy Father's Day, by the way, to all you fathers. A young woman brings home her fiance to meet her parents. After dinner, her mother tells her father to find out about this young man. The father invites the fiance to his study for a drink. So, what are your plans, young man? The father asks him. I'm a Bible student at the university, he replies, I want to become a pastor. A pastor, hmm, the father says. Admirable, but what will you do to provide a nice house for my daughter to live in as she is accustomed to? I will study, the young man replies, and God will, will provide for us. And how will you buy her a beautiful engagement ring such as she deserves? I will concentrate on my studies, the young man says. God will provide for us. And children, asks the father, how will you support your children? Don't worry, sir, God will provide. The conversation proceeds like this, and each time the father questions, the young man of faith insists that God will provide. Later, the mother asks, how did it go, honey? The father answers, he has no job, no plans, but the good news is he thinks I'm God. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. All righty, if you'll join me with the call to worship, please. Thank you, God, for our fathers. Thank you, God, for our mothers. Thank you, God, for our families. Thank you, God, for the family of the church. Thank you, God, that you are our God and Father. Thank you, God. Amen. Now, if you'll please stand and join us in our praise themes starting with 87.
Good morning. Let us start out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus, who came down and, and saved us all. And Lord, help us use this time to just exalt that name. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to your instruction. And help us to use this time of fellowship to build each other up. And Lord, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And let us go to our next one, Faith of Our Fathers, 692. Grant's going to come around and collect the prayer requests. And while he does that, we are going to sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 3, and that's found on 584. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with our prayer requests. Lord, um, we ask that you would meet these according to your will and according to you, um, your plan. And Lord, as you meet these needs, Lord, help them to, to glorify you. Lord, we were talking about um, in Sunday school about how things are seem impossible to us that uh, things would never turn out the way they were, uh, that some situations seem hopeless and some people seem hopeless, but Lord, you are so powerful and all good that you can take what looks impossible to us and make it happen and make it happen for your your glory. So Lord, we pray for those people that, that don't know you yet, whether they be family members or friends. Um, we pray for all the people in the country that may be in this way. Lord, that we know that some people will reject you, but Lord, you gave us the command to go out and and to, to preach to to everybody, Lord. So um, we don't need to necessarily get up on every corner and, and yell at people as they go by, but Lord, help us to live in a way that's according to your word and help that to be our witness to others. And Lord, we, we expand our prayer out to the people outside the United States, Lord, that um, whether people be persecuted, uh, persecuted members of the church or persecuted anybody out there, Lord, that you would give them strength and that you would give them um, increased faith to cling to you in these, in these times of hardship. And Lord, we also pray for the people that, that persecute them. Lord, we pray that they would see the error behind persecuting your church and your people because Lord going against you nobody's nobody's going to win so Lord help them to realize that they're in a futile position that going against you is just going to get them mowed over <laughs> and Lord we, we pray for uh, the church that recently got um, shot up Lord, that we pray for those families that are in grieving. And Lord, we thank you for the families that have been acting in Christ-like ways after this. Lord, help their witness to go out and um, be received by people who are looking on. And Lord, we pray for the guy who went in and did it, Lord, that Lord, help him to see the error of his ways. And Lord, that we know that you don't, or that we don't know what's in his heart, Lord. But Lord, we would ask that you would soften it and change it to a heart that is for you instead of for evil and hatred and all that. So Lord, we come to you with all these different requests and all these different um, problems. But Lord, we know that they're in good hands as in your hands, Lord, because you are that all good, all powerful, and just God. And Lord, we thank you for being able to come to you boldly and tell us your prayer and tell us your prayers. We thank you for hearing them, and Lord, we thank you for your grace. And we pray in Christ's name, Amen. How many of you have your bulletins with you? There's a, a section in the bulletin that says this, a time of sharing. James 127 Project. How many, how many of you here today worked on the James 127 Project? Those of you who worked 
on the James 127 project. I'd like a couple of you to come up here in front, would you, please? Don't all rush at one time. You come over here. Yes. <laughs> Janet actually spearheaded this project, so I'm going to let her go first. And I just want her to share a little bit. And what I want you to know is that every time we do a James 127 project, which hopefully is not just on the months that have five Sundays, but we get so involved in doing James 127 that we forget about what week it is, okay? Now that doesn't give you the right to miss church. Only on the fifth Sunday will we close church. You're up. Thank you. I am. <laughs> I didn't mean to scare you. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody who participated. It really, it made a difference, especially I'm going to be a little selfish here in my life. As you know, my husband can't do a whole lot of physical work. And we had a bunch of rocks around a tree that needed to be removed. And we were blessed with Quinn, John, Bob, Drew, and Carl, right? That was, yeah. That came and within an hour, these guys worked like crazy. Um, and so blessed because I couldn't have done it by myself, and my husband certainly couldn't have done it by himself. Um, but this James 127 project, we started a couple years ago, and it kind of fell off. Um, so we reinitiated it. And just to let you know, please check on the website. We now have a tab for the project. If you have any pictures from participating, uh, any testimonies, send it to Jan. She will gladly put it on the website. Um, other than that, I know that Tom and, and Troy and their families went and worked. Jack worked, John worked, Bob worked. Christy and Ada all went and visited. And all the, Arlene and all of them went and visited. And Debbie Bill. Jones. Debbie Jones. Debbie Jones. Yep, forgot about you, sorry. Um, and everybody, Bill. And, and Mary, they worked around. Everybody participated, um, the Georges. So you just got to get involved. And even if it's just a little bit, just going to visit somebody, it makes a big difference. So here you go. We visited a lady. I don't remember her name. But um, we... <laughs> We helped clean out gutters and stuff, and it was amazing how much of a difference it made to her and how happy she was to have that done, to have company, and just to have somebody there and just kind of talk to us. And so, yeah. I, I will reinforce what she said. Troy was with me. You know something? It wasn't about the work for me. We made a difference in a lady's life, and... And I know we promised that we're going to go visit her and stuff like that, and we're going to do that. It's stuff we should be doing every day. We shouldn't need the James 127 project to go out and do this. We have neighbors that might need a hand moving rocks. We have neighbors that might need a hand and they can't do gutters. And it's not about being physically able to go out and work either. We have neighbors that just want to talk to somebody. And, I mean, even this woman's... 90-something-year-old mother, am I right about age, somewhere in there? She uh, couldn't talk, but she was all there, and she could communicate, and she just lit up. This is just, I mean, I mean it's not about an individual project for me. It's about, it, it made me realize that, you know something, just being nice. And that nice might be holding the door open at the gas station for the next person coming in. It might be, 
I mean, the, the, the nice is up to you. And, you know, we can all do this, and we don't need the fifth Sunday because there's four other Sundays, and then there's six other days of the week in each of those weeks Amen. that we could do one little thing for somebody. Uh, Bill Lewick and I went out to uh, Joyce's house and helped her uh, with some stuff around the inside of the house that she couldn't do, get up on some ladders and stuff like that that she couldn't get up on. And then we pulled out some old dead rose bushes that were really tough coming out. <laughs> <laughs> one huge one that was really tough. And uh, after that, Bill and I came back to the church and actually uh, fit the covers over some of the basement windows that we've been needing to do for a long time. We got several of those done, too. Well, after, <clears throat> excuse me. After we got done at the Grimes' house, um, I went with uh, Quinn and Carl and Andrew out to an assisted living uh, place in Oswego called Autumn, Autumn Leaves, and we did a mini youth service uh, for the um, folks out there with the communion service. And they really, really liked having, I think, the service, but they really, really liked having um, Quinn and Carl there. And I want to thank those guys and Adam but I really want to thank the kids for coming out with me to do that. We're going to be doing more of that, and a lot of you guys are going to hopefully come. And I encourage you all to um, think about coming with me when I do this, but also for the James 127 project. Um, get involved and just help and do something. It's a great start for you. It's not nobody's going to ask you to do something that you're not capable of doing. But um, it, in the end, it's going to be a good thing for everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Give them a hand. Do we have any children today? Hmm? Oh, readings first. I'm sorry. Y'all can. You guys can sit there. I, I don't I care. Apologize. You can sit there. <laughs> I'm fine with you sitting down there. Uh, the reading is called Father and Daughter. The bond between father and daughter happens instantly, starting right at birth. When a father first lays eyes on his little girl, he loves her more than anything on this earth. When a daughter grows older, her father is the first man she will love. And the last one, her father will have trouble letting go of. In her eyes, he is the closest thing to God. In her eyes, he is king. To her father, she means the world. She means everything. When a daughter grows up to be an adult and mature, her father will always be there anytime she needs dad to help her, to give her advice, or just for anything she will ever need. The bond between father and daughter is the most important bond indeed. It cannot be broken when she finds a man and becomes a wife. It cannot be broken even in the ending of either one's life. A daughter will always have the memories of her father, her best friend. <laughs> this bond uh, this bond between father and daughter is so profound the love shared is well renowned from the beginning of his daughter's life he is a changed man and at that moment his life really just began from the moment their eyes met two souls instantly become complete Today's scripture reading is taken from the prophet Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Through the fig tree does not blossom, and there are no grapes on the vines. Through the olive crop fails, and the field produces no food. Through there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the, in the God of my salva salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. The, re the, the reason I couldn't say anything to you is I was sitting there crying. <laughs> I'm not emotional or anything much. My, uh, let me get this to you.
you. I thought Elizabeth was coming down. <laughs> You're that young anyway. Anyhow, let me talk to you. When you hear the word generosity, what do you think of? Do what? Giving people money or something they need. Okay, anyone else? Have you ever thought of generosity as an investment? Well, the Bible tells us in a scripture, it says, give, and it will be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God will give to you. Did any of you guys here ever see a movie, Pay It Forward? Any of you adults ever see that movie? One? Is that all? Well, that's good. It's better than zero. But you see, pay it forward means this. Let me, let me share a little story that happened to me one day. What's it mean? Oh, okay. I was standing in line at a gas station getting a cup of coffee. Of course, you all know I don't care much for coffee, right? Yeah, I do. But anyway, I was getting a cup of coffee, and there was a man standing behind me, and he had a, a large cup of coffee, which cost a dollar five cents. Okay, and I noticed him counting out change for his coffee. So when I went up to pay for my coffee, I told the girl behind the register, I'll pay for his too. So I paid for it, walked out, and he stood up there and counted out a dollar five cents out of his change, and she said, oh, it's already paid for. And I could hear the exchange. He said, who did it? And she said, he did. And by the time I got out to my truck, he was coming out to see me. And he said, why did you do that? I said, because I just felt like it was a nice thing to do. He said, well, here, let me pay you. I've got the money. I said, it's not about the money, sir. It's about giving ahead. So the next day, I come in to get a cup of coffee. And the cashier says, do you know who that was? I said, no, it's Doc something or the other. He's got enough money to buy the county if he wanted to. But you see, it doesn't matter whether someone can pay you back or has the money or not. It's that you're investing in someone else. Listen to what it says here. The scripture says, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Real generosity is doing something nice for someone who will never find out. We have people in our church that help us out, but we don't know who they are. They help out financially, just like James 127 Project. They do things for other people that sometimes we don't even know those things. Generosity goes further. I want you to listen to this discussion question. One way to be generous is to give your old clothing either to charity or to a family in need twice a year. What other ways can you think of to be generous? How about you guys? What other ways can you think of it? How about what we did at, at the Grimes' house in the James 127 project? There's no way that Kim and Janet could do that on their own. Well, there is. They could sit there on the ground and pick up one rock at a time. But you see, it's doing something for someone that, that's really nice to do for you. It's sort of like going to your grandma's house, you know, and she's got a pile of dishes, and you guys say, Graham, let me do the dishes. How many of you have ever done that? Awesome. You've done it for your mom. That's the same principle, you see what I'm saying? And then what happens? Mom thinks, awfully nice of you, right? Grandma says, wow, I'll, I'll help you out when it comes time the next time you need a dollar or two extra, right? But we don't do it for that reason. We do it because we're giving to the Lord. Everything we give, if we give it as we're giving it unto the Lord, always gets multiplied back. But if you keep it, it'll rot and go away. So remember, give and it will be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. 
Okay? Can you remember that? Don't forget. You think you already forgot? You didn't? Okay. <laughs> you guys go ahead. Give, and it will be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Why do you have to run over something? It means overflowing. Sort of like when you put too much coffee in a cup, it overflows. Cool. Well, will our ushers come forward, please, and we'll receive our morning offering. Remember the story you just heard. Oh, no. Stand with me and let's sing page 507, the first verse. thank you and give you praise for all that you've poured out upon us. And God, as we return just a portion of the many blessings you've given, God, may you look upon our lives and see the joy that we have in giving. And God, may the joy that we have in giving multiply back unto us. And Father, I just pray that now you would make us wise stewards of all you've given. And Father, that here in this assembly, we, God, would be open to your spirit and the leading of that spirit. Guide us, direct us, speak to us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
serve a great and awesome God. Praise you, Jesus, right? Amen. have your Bibles. I was going to preach the sermon that it says in the bulletin about Fresh Start Mountain. I just want you to look at Luke chapter 15 for a moment. Then Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Hey, Pops, give me the portion of goods that falls to me when you die. I want it now. You understand I'm adding a little bit of understanding. Okay? So he divided them. He divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with riotous living. Now some versions will tell you prodigal living, but same difference. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the field so that he could feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. We just talked about paying it forward. We just talked about doing good deeds. But it says here that no one would give him anything. Ever been there? But when he came to himself. That's a very important phrase, but when he came to himself. In other words, he was living, how was he living prior to coming to himself? He was living his own life on his own terms, but now something happened to him. And he came to an understanding that what he had was not what he did have, but what he had now was what was left of what he had. And what he had his father gave to him. He didn't really even earn it. How many of you all te have taught your children to earn things at home? Allowance, working for you, you know, doing things around the house, earns them what? Either dollars or benefits, right? Now, if you remember several years ago, I did a, a, a children's sermon on you have no more chores. Remember that? Anybody remember that? The kids, the kids went, yay! But I charged the kids to do what we adults are supposed to do in this world. Whatever needs to be done, do it. Not whatever you want to do, do it. That's the Nike commercial, if it feels good, do it, right? That's exactly where this boy got in trouble leaving home. It felt good, so he was going to do it. I made up my mind I was going to try to be less passionate about this today. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to eat and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Hey, Dad, I've sinned against you in heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just let me go to work for you. I don't know if any of you have ever worked for your father or not. I did. He was the hardest taskmaster I had. But thank God I learned to work for my dad. Because working for my dad, I could work for anyone. And believe me, when I worked for the car dealership, it was worse than working for my dad. Monty Shear, hope he listens to this. I send him the link every week, so... Monty, I hope you're listening. 
Monty Shear was one of the hardest guys I ever worked with or for. But you know what? My experience with my dad made it easier for me to work with him. Well, I perish for hunger. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I just want to be a hired servant. I'll even go through the job corps if I can get a job with you. But I just want to come and work. And he rose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against in your sight and no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, Shut up. No, he didn't say that, but he said this. But the father said unto the servant, Bring our best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is now found. And they began to make merry. Now, that would be a great place to end this story, especially on Father's Day. But you see, this father had compassion. He had great heart. And the son that came back had something that, that was really unique. He had a heart for the father. Father's Day is about dads and their heart. I saw on Facebook today, a lot of people posted a lot of great things about their dad. Christy put one on that was just incredible. And you know, you know what that comes from? That comes from a relationship. This son, though he was prodigal, though he left, though he ran, though he spent, though he went with women and drank and smoked and did crack and heroin and drugs and all those crazy things, when it came down to the point where he was ready to die, he said, I'll go back to dad. Now, I don't know about you, but after both of my parents passed away, my dad died in 1972, my mom in 1982, and 1984, all of a sudden it was like this huge floodgate of emotion opened up in me, and I was, it was on Christmas Day, I was working on her car, and all of a sudden, 1984, all of a sudden tears just began to flow out of my eyes. And I missed my mom and dad. You know what? You know what the words that came out of my mouth were? Who am I going to ask for help? Who am I going to go to when I have a question? What am I going to do? You see, it all centered on me. What do you mean it's centered on you? I need help. I want my mom. I want my dad. Folks, I want to tell you what. There's nothing any worse than missing your, your parents. Some of you understand that there is something worse. It's missing your wife or husband. But thank God I don't know that yet. Your friends. But I want you to hear something. It, this isn't about the prodigal son. This is about the father and the son that stayed home. Now the older son was in the field. And he came and he drew near to the house. And he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the serpents and he says, What do these things mean? And he said it to them, Your brother's come. And because he received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Listen to these words. But he was angry. And would not go in. He was mad. He was mad because the brother. I posted a picture today of my dad and my brother. And I was mad at my brother for a long time for taking his own life. I was mad because I couldn't stop it. I couldn't intervene. I couldn't change the outcome. It's no different than someone that has cancer and dies. Do you know how many people I've prayed for to be healed of cancer, leukemia, or some disease? 
I've laid hands on them, and I've prayed. I've anointed them with oil, and I've prayed. And I said, God, please, in Jesus' name, heal them. And he takes them home, and I want to scream and holler. My mom had lung cancer, lost over three-fourths of both lungs. Half of her stomach was taken out. And I said, God, heal my mom. And she died. He healed my mom better than I could have. He healed my mom in a way. My friends, he gave her such a great body. My mom was a knockdown, drag out, gorgeous woman. Look at some of the pictures I, I put on Facebook of her when she was a young girl. But she was my mom. And I wanted God to do it my way. This, this son that stayed home was mad and wouldn't even go into the house. He wouldn't even talk to his dad. How many of you have been that mad at God? No, you don't have to be honest. He knows. We live in Beecher, Illinois. And our, our parents lived in, since, in Dayton and, and Hillsboro, Ohio and all kinds of crazy places far away. And they got sick and I couldn't go. And then when I went and I prayed for my friend W.V. Grant had a church right around the corner from Christ Hospital there in Cincinnati. And I called W.V. up and I, I couldn't get a hold of him, but I got a hold of his secretary. Have, have W.V. come and pray for my mom. He had a healing minister. And I knew that if he come and he laid his hand on her, that she would be healed. And he couldn't come, wouldn't come, didn't come. And guess who got mad at W.V. Grant? Your pastor, the holy man that stands in front of you on Sunday, got mad at him. And I bore that, that anger in my heart for three years. And in 1985, I'm at Oral Roberts University. We're there at the Charismatic Bible Ministries Conference. And we're 7,000 ministers standing there singing worship songs. I got my hands up in the air, raised and praising God. Hallelujah, glory to the King. And I look one row over, two seats down, and guess who's standing there? Walter Victor Grant. I look the other way, and I'm worshiping. And the worship just getting worse and worse. Finally, I hear these words, go apologize. I ain't apologizing to him. I said, go apologize. Okay, Lord, here's what I'll do. I'll close my eyes. And I'll finish this worship session that we're having. And if when I open my eyes, WV's still standing there, and there's nobody in my way to get to him, I'll, go, I'll walk out of my row and around this row, and I'll go over and apologize to him. <laughs> Sir, the worship part's over with, and I open my eyes. There's nobody in the row. Mike Emig, the kid that went with me, was standing next to me. He moved out of the seat. And I look over and there's W.V. Grant looking square at me. So I come around and I say, W.V., I'm sorry. He says, no, Bill, I apologize to you. I said, no, you don't understand. God told me to come and apologize to you. Why? I'm the one that didn't do it. I'm the one that didn't go. The real person with the problem in this story about prodigal son was the one that stayed home. Because he thought something was owed to him. I thought God owed me the, at least the, the, the privilege of having Walter go to my mom and pray for her and heal her. But you see, if my mom would have survived the surgery that she had, she'd have eaten pre-digested food, been on oxygen, 
been on a bag, not been able to go any more than five miles away from home, and she loved to come out to our house and see the grandbabies. And God said, I'll heal her. Those of you who've ever heard me preach a funeral, you've heard me say this story about how my girls were mad at God over Grandma's death. And we didn't... I, I ran out of... Out of illustrations, I couldn't, I couldn't comfort them. I couldn't tell them how to deal with it or anything else. But one day, all of a sudden, the light came on. We were living in Beecher. We'd just moved from Dover. I threw three girls in the back of a Volkswagen Rabbit. If you've ever had three girls in the back of a Volkswagen Rabbit, here's what they say. Mom, she's touching me. Dad, make her move. She's too close. We drove from Beecher to Princeton, pulled up in front of the parsonage there in Dover, Illinois. And I said to my kids, what's that? And Kelly, my oldest daughter, you, you have to really know her well. She says, well, dummy, that's our old house. I said, exactly. That's exactly what Grandma had, an old house that was ruined, rotten, falling apart. And now, she has a brand new body. This prodigal, the one that stayed home, had that attitude. God, you owe me. Dad, you owe me. I stayed home. Our youngest daughter is much like the first prodigal. She liked to run all over the country. Huh? Las Vegas, Atlanta, back home, Minneapolis. And the other two daughters stayed around home. And they won't tell you this, but just like the prodigals that stayed home, they got mad at her. Because she was the baby. She was the one that supposedly got everything. Now you all think, what's this all got to do with anything? <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the money that he spent. It has nothing to do with the sin that he committed. It has nothing to do with the... the <clears throat> The one that stayed home being mad, it has nothing to do with the servants serving and all the other kind of things. You know what it has to do with? It has to do with the condition of the heart. The first son, even though he ran and did all those things, really had a heart for the father. Now you say, no, he had a heart for being safe and secure and having a roof over his head. No, he could have died where he was. He could have made it big where he was. He could have been successful where he was. But you know what? He said, I'm going home. Listen to those words. I'm going home. I don't know if any of you keep up with the prophetic news <clears throat> that happens around and the things people say. You know, today was supposed to be the last day of time. The rapture was supposed to take place today. Well, the day's not over, and it could take place. And I'm not going to, you know, question if it does, because I want to go, right? We all want to be in that great homecoming in the sky, don't we? But you see, the Bible tells me that no man knows the time, the day, or the hour. Somebody trying to predict that, you can predict the signs of the time. You can say it's near. We know when winter's coming, don't we? We know when spring's on its way. Well, not in this area we don't. It's either winter or summer. And then it's either wet or dry. Or no construction, construction. But it's a heart issue, folks. If you today 
were to step out of this building and suddenly meet Jesus Christ face to face. Are you at a point where he would do what the father did to the prodigal? Throw his arms around your neck. Tell all the servants to go get the robe and a ring and put it on your finger. Are you in that position that that prodigal son was? And said, Father, I'm not worthy of this. I just want to be your servant. I just want to work for you. And he says, welcome in. Come on in. Why? Why should I let you in? I don't deserve to be in, God. And he says, you're right. I'm letting you in because of what someone else did. Thousands of people, one and a half billion Muslims, one billion people who follow other religions other than Christ. That's two and a half billion people. If the Lord would return right now, would spend eternity in the lake of fire. Does that bother anyone? It does me. It bothers me as bad as the Vietnam veteran standing on the side of the road begging for a few dollars. It bothers me as much as the Exxon executive that I knew that lived under the 31st Street Viaduct. It bothers me as bad as the people that come knocking on my door and asking me for help that I don't have the money to help them. The Bible says in the book of Acts that that the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. He didn't add church members. I want you all to understand that. He added people to the body of Christ. You know what Jesus said to those people? Come on in. Come on in. Not in a building but in the family. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I probably should have preached a sermon. But I probably would have been miserable the rest of the day. Because God laid this on my heart. <clears throat> I'll say this, and I believe it with all my heart, and then we'll close There is a great revival coming. And if you want your seat singled out for you, when you leave today, I'll give you my label maker, put it on, because I believe God's going to do something really great with us. But it's not just in the building. It's out of the building. But it's all part of the family of God. I believe revival's coming. We won't recognize it because it'll be different than a series of meetings in a tent and, you know, Billy Sunday and Billy Beagle and all those other kind. It's going to be a revival that's going to be spearheaded by you. And when I say you, I'm talking about those who are willing to go beyond 10.30 on Sunday morning. Stand with me, please. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may the mighty name of Jesus be praised and blessed here today. Father, I ask you to Take our hand to lead us. And God will give you praise and glory. Father, I pray a special prayer today that you fill everyone with your Holy Spirit. 
And God, if they have a personal and living relationship with you, that God, you not only fill them with the Holy Spirit, but today you would put a direction upon their lives. God, a calling. And Father, that from this moment forth, that we would no longer be a church, but we would be part of the church of the living God. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn to page 445, please? 445. I should have told her. We're just going to sing the first verse. I, 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 I want to make this statement to you. If you today have a calling and, a, and, a, and, and God has spoken to you, I want to pray with you. And I want you to come forward and pray. let me pray with you. Let's sing first verse. If but for one, God says, I love you. Just like the song says, just as I am. You're dismissed. <laughs>